the reason that, I mean, they have different types of tourism. Eh? They have, there's a type of tourism that they describe as business tourism. And then there's resort. And, and that's the reason why I, I differentiated and I called the Tobago Hilton, which was in the late 90s and was opened in 2000. I called that the first large scale resort project in which the government was involved as a heavy investor. Okay? And that's why it's important to study it and see why it went wrong, because it certainly went wrong. And I agreed that Trinidad Hilton and Hyatt are business hotels. That's what they're there for, for conferences and business travelers and so on. And the occasional civil society function, we'll go to a wedding or a graduation or something, but it's a business hotel. Okay, so that's that. I will leave it at that for now, unless anybody else wants to. I think the, the point he was making is that a lot of the business is actually government Absolutely, yeah. generated. Yeah, yeah, quite right, quite right. A lot of the thing it comes from ministries and state agencies and uh, the other hotels that are coming up in Port of Spain, because there are other hotels coming up, huh? there are there are I think four other hotels on the on the cards in the Port of Spain area. There is a a large hotel on the cards at Invaders Bay which the Chinese are promoting through the Minister of Finance speaks very favorably about it. If you go back to the mid-year budget review from last year, um, Mr. Imbert speaks very favorably about it for this International Financial Center. That is a big hotel down at Invaders Bay. There's another hotel planned at the Ministry of Agriculture site at the top of the Magnificent Seven, near to Sinclair Circle, on the site of the Ministry of Agriculture because they've now moved to Shagonas. There's another big hotel there. There's a third big hotel, which the Rahel Group have been involved in. They have, they have relabeled themselves, so there's a different name they're going under. And they have purchased the, uh, the Carlton Savannah, I think, for 135 million TT. And they're going to rebadge it and relabel it as part of the Marriott suite of hotels. So there's another, another hotel coming there. And there's a fourth one in Port of Spain that I can't talk about because I was working on it. So. But it's happening. Okay? And it's not far from here. There's a fourth one, okay? So there are four, and stop it. There are four, um, <laughs> there are four hotels that, that are coming up in addition to that competition in that sector. They're all, they're all business type hotels. That's a big question. I don't know the answer exactly. Um, this is a kind of a, a process where we're working it out together. We have, to, we have to make up our mind what it is we want to know and have a method to get it and to validate it. It's not just a question of getting a brown envelope because you could put out a request and a brown envelope would turn up at my house or my office. But the other side could always say, well, that's just a brown envelope. The question is getting it in a particular form that is properly validated and you could use that to base a position on. Where we go from there, I don't, have a, I don't have a particular exact answer for you. We have all kinds of changes. We have projects that have been reversed in the country's history. For people who think that things are irreversible, things aren't irreversible. Those of us who are old enough to remember, some of members of the audience are. Remember the Karani? racing project and you have things that could be reversed when something is so absurd you literally cannot continue with it in a time of hardship so things could be reversed Sabrina um, how exactly it'll go I don't know I can't see that far into the future I could see here and I could do this piece but I can't see that far and we'll work it out I may not be here when all of that happens you know the question about the collateral developments like the water treatment plant and the electricity supply and the improvement to the airport the collateral developments that are inevitable there's a way that we have to be careful when we have any development conversation about that type of situation. Because where we have a situation with erratic and bizarre development priorities, and Terry Farrell spoke about it last week with the highway and the sandals, and the same thing with the airport and so on, the allocation of capital is erratic. Where we have that situation, we can develop in a society the feeling in a community that I don't care what it costs as long as I get a new bridge. Or I don't care what it costs as long as I have good water where I'm living. And in fact, you get an attitude that can develop, which is, which is really close to being the situation in Trinidad and Tobago. You can get an attitude that, develop, that, that can develop that says, I want this development at any cost. Now I'm not talking about sandals, I'm talking about the supplementary things. And you can end up in a situation where we can end up overpaying for things, which is what has been the pattern actually in the country. 
speaking as a participant in the development industry, that's what has happened in the country. There isn't a single project that's been on cost and on budget. Not one. There really hasn't been any. Because, because there's that pent up thing, and as a, as, a, as, a, as a public official, you could do just about anything, and people will be glad for the water, they'll be glad for the bridge. So I understand that there's an inevitability to those development requirements. But we have to watch the other side of it too. The other point I would say to you is that although you are coming off resort, and some people who go to all inclusives do come off resort, it's a very rare thing. Having been to all inclusives myself, it's a very rare thing to come off resort. A lot of people just stay there because they have a night for steel band, they have a night for limbo, they have different nights, and you can actually experience the Caribbean thing. No, it, that's what it is. They have different nights, and you can experience it without leaving the resort. Just tell you straight away, we started the research to construct the research program in September and October last year. And we've been engaged in it, letter writing and so on, for the last year or so. So we've gotten bits and pieces, fragments of information. We're about to launch one litigation out of the four agencies that we've, that we've targeted. And uh, that is ETEC. And uh, it's really about a year. You're bringing out an important point, uh, Steve, yeah? What it, what it is is this, is that Yes, Steve, we have a different model. And because of the amount of cash we have in this country, in terms of the wealth of Trinidad and Tobago, we have been able, we being the Treasury, have been able to design and build and fit and furnish the three big hotels I talked about. And even if you want to say Tobago Hilton is a different example, when this project fell into crisis in 07 going into 08, the government at the time was able to find enough funds, enough state funds, to pay off the private investors and take virtually complete ownership of Vanguard. So, the, so the, the facts are there, there was enough money. In terms of the impact, there's two ways to look at impact. One is financial and one is non-financial. Financially, we don't know. This is the point I'm making. We don't know, apart from snippets and fragments and so on. We don't actually know how this hotel is functioning or Hilton Hotel is functioning. We don't know the figures. We don't have anything to go on, and that's what the research is intended to uncover. In non-financial terms, it's interesting. Because the biggest hotels in the country are owned by the state, because the biggest hotels in the country owned by the state actually take up, Steve, the commanding heights, quotation marks of the hotel industry. You have a situation, it happened in the last week, and it kind of was made clear to me in a conversation I had with somebody yesterday, the day before, they were in my office chatting. And it's this. So we had this crisis two or three days ago at Piaco with the immigration officers. I think only two out of 15 came out to work and there was this people waiting for hours and it was inconvenient and so on. And the person who was in my office was saying to me, the person is somebody involved in the industry. The person said to me, Afra, because the biggest hotels are owned by the state and because the state controls the commanding heights, of the hotel industry. You're not going to hear anything from the hotel sector. The hotel association, this and the hotel, they're not going to hear anything. So in fact, all we've heard is two chambers of commerce have made various statements. The hotel groups, as my mother would say, they're not going to hear anything from them. If it had been in Jamaica, where the hotels are owned by and large, by private capitalists, they would have blown up all this. They say, what the hell is this? if it had been in St. Lucia, and so on and so on. But in Trinidad and Tobago, Steve, to come with the non-financial consequences of the model, because of the peculiar model we have here, where the biggest show in town is the state. And if the state is involved in something wrong on this side, the state actors on this side are going to be silent about it. So we have a kind of code of silence thing running here, and it disfigures the discourse. So that is, I will leave it like that for now, but it's a really excellent question. Um, after two, two, um, two answers came. The first question was a simple one <laughs> about what's the value of the Golden Grove Estate. And I, I guess that is to do with the whole transaction where the, the state transferred the property to itself for I think 174 or 175 million TT. And I did a violation of it 21 years ago or something. So I'm familiar with the, with the land and so on. And if I were to do a violation today, I don't think it'll cross 200 million. So that, that was in the ballpark. 
I'm not concerned. All of that stuff Dupree and them were talking about the land, Peter Purnell, the land is worth three something, the land is worth four something. All of them got quiet now. Shwa. The land is worth 175 million or 185 million, and that's all. So that talk that was pumping in the papers, all of them, they had Ramesh and they had John Jeremy and they had this one, everything just got quiet. <laughs> to come to the point now with information, this situation about hiding stuff, I talked about this last time I was here, and it's real close to my heart. Eh? This situation about hiding stuff is a serious thing. Eh? Some of the biggest state agencies in the country have a pattern. And this, this is going to sound incredible to some of you who don't know. Eh? Maguire might have an idea. See, I'm going to put in his body to get ready for it. When, <laughs> when, when an election comes in and you know you're going to lose. No, no, I'm telling you all what's happening. Eh? When an election comes in and under all the old talk, you know you're going to get licks. You were there for eight years. You were there for six years. You were there for 12 years. You know that. You know you were there and you know you're not going to be there next month. A lot of fires just get shredded. Eh? A lot of things just disappear. And it's a true fact. Eh? And at some serious state agencies that ought to be sober. Huh? Yeah. State agencies that ought to be sober and responsible and, and statutory bodies and so on. If they see this thing coming down the pipeline, I can remember a case. I'll tell this story. <coughs> Pardon me. I won't say which state authority it is because it's kind of part of my work. But there was a state agency where I had done negotiations against them on a big piece of land, a big, a big significant piece of land. A long negotiation that went on two and a half years. It was finished. But it was a very significant piece of land with a very significant investment to take place. And that state agency became embroiled in one of the biggest scandals of the last 20 years. Long story short, election came and the party X lost and party Y won. So party Y put a chairman in, who I knew vaguely. The guy was an engineer. I knew the guy professionally and socially, hi, hi. And he called me a day and said, I'd like to see you. So I said, sure. And I went to his office, which was in this big place with no name. And we had coffee and we were chatting. And he was saying to me, well, you know, because um, he, he asked me to bring the file for this thing, that, this piece of land we were negotiating on. And he said, well, you know, um, you have the survey plan for that? So I showed it to him. And then he said to me, so you have a letter that we wrote where we offered to do this? And I showed it to him. And after about three of these little things, I said to him, hold on, hold on. You don't have the file. He was like, no. He looked, he's looking really shame, man. He's like, no. I say you don't have any files, do you? He said, no. And then he closed his eyes. He said, look what they do me. And he was taking me to the office. And all, he's the chairman, all the files they have, and that's empty, yeah? You see him? <laughs> look what they do me. He said, you have any files? Because I don't know a lot of cases against them. I said, yeah, I have files. And I actually photocopied about 40 files and give it to him to help him to restock. So they actually have a process they go through. No, you're all laughing like it's a joke, eh? They have a process that they go through when they know they're going to get licks in an election. And they were up to Ratchafi in, 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 in bulk to just destroy files. Eh? So what, um, what, what you're talking about there is, Kim, is absolutely correct. Eh? That, it's really a serious thing. It's not just, I think somebody said NCC just now. It's not just Carnival and Panorama and things. It's a lot of other things too. It's happening. You know, it's a serious thing. You know? Sorry, what's the question? <laughs> what's, the, what's the question? No, no, no. He has, he has some kind of... Where's the microphone? Oh, Robert Deary, you don't want to give it to Nigel. It's like that, yeah? Oh, you have it like that, yeah. You don't want to give it to Nigel. Go on, Robert Deary. Go on, Robert Deary, yeah, yeah. Okay, let me just answer two questions here. <clears throat> I'll take Robert Deary's point about local content to make, to make a little example from Barbados. So when Barbados got these sandals at... Um, at that hotel at St. Lawrence Gap. One of the issues that emerged coming out of the fact that the new Sanders was there and they had, they had gotten all these concessions from the Barbados government, tax concessions and so on. One of the issues that emerged was that they weren't using any Barbados rum. So rum is regarded in a particular market as a premium product, a particular grades of rum, okay? But the, the Butch Stewart business model all the rum he used was coming from Jamaica. He had a particular set of commercial arrangements, okay? Which we haven't even gone into that level of the thing yet. 
he had a set of commercial arrangements of his own that linked him with the Jamaican rum magnates. And he was doing that in all of his sandals. So the Bajans found themselves, to, go, to bounce it through his point, the Bajans found themselves thinking that, well, Sanders is coming, and that will be so many people a week. And, our, and in fact, they didn't want any rum from Barbados. And they had to make a big protest. I forget exactly how it unfolded. It was in things in the papers, and MPs were raising points, and so on and so on. And eventually, both Stuart resiled. And I think they have a percentage of it that is, that is Bajan rum. But it was a whole thing. Because if you don't watch every point, which is the point you're making, if you don't watch every point along the, along the equation, even something as obvious as you might tell yourself, well, it makes more sense for them to use rum from Barbados. No, it doesn't make more sense because you don't know the arrangement a man really has. <laughs> and because if you don't know the arrangement, because you're not curious about asking the arrangement, we have to be alive to the underlying commercial arrangements, which is what it is I am trying to campaign on. Josan, your point about the environmental concerns arising from the construction of a large-scale hotel at No Man's Land Stroke Golden Grove Estate, and, and the sort of impact it could have and so on. That's not part of our research. Let me just be really clear. Our research is specifically into the underlying commercial arrangements, the performance of the three existing state-owned hotels. And we are using that process and, the, and the, the things we are able to get out of that to inform an approach to the fourth hotel that is now being proposed. We, are not, we haven't issued any FOI about the sandals. Just to be totally clear what we're doing and what we're not doing. We haven't interrogated the EMA. We haven't interrogated town and country. We haven't done any of that. Our focus is on the three existing state-owned hotels. So the, I think it's a matter of tremendous concern and interest, but that's not what we focus on. Just to be totally clear with you. That, that's actually a lovely point, because what it brings to, what it brings to mind for me, and it, it also bounces at the point Kim made earlier on, about the whole question of accountability and democracy. It brings to mind, for me, the whole question of the model we're using. And I can remember a conversation we had at my home some years ago. Two or three people who were here were, were there that, on that occasion, where, in fact, a close friend of mine, who at the time was the chairman of the PNM, attended my house for some kind of line. He was my friend before he was chairman. <laughs> and um, <laughs> we ended up having some drinks and talking. And it got into something resembling an argument. Because, of course, they were in power. And uh, people were angry about this was happening. Mr. Manning was the prime minister, and that was happening, and this was nothing, and so on and so on. And that individual, because he's a very plain speaking individual, that individual actually broke down for us how they look at this thing of governance. Eh? And he was this Afro Afro. But I wasn't arguing with him. Other people were. I think one of them is one of them is there. And another one is in the back there. Other people were arguing with him and getting upset. And he eventually said, you know something? It's really very simple, you know. All this at that time I had been leading a campaign against you, the court and call the heart and the buildings in Port of Spain and all of those other things. There was that that was 207 and 08 and 09 and things. And he said, Afra, listen, it's really simple, you know. We have a democracy. And there's an election. And every five years or so, there's a competition between that party and our party. And in Trinidad and Tobago, for better or for worse, nobody's killed during an election or anything. They have a lot of argument and cussing, and some people will lie, and some will go too far, and some will play the music too loud. And at the end of it all, it's a contest, and somebody wins. And the way we look at it, if we win, we being PNM, if we win, and we have won an election fair and square, we swear our people in chairman of this and minister of that and so on and so on. That's it. We don't have to ask you all anything again. You all put us there to run the place. And in fact, their point of view, and he wasn't being facetious or anything, he's a real straight talking person. His point of view is, and he was, I, I took it that he was speaking to the PNM, his point of view is this. Every five years, you have a chance to express yourself. You express yourself, it is over. Everything else is old talk. Now, of course, that's not my point of view. But I'm just saying it to inform you all, and to bounce with Steve and to bounce with Kim, that this is very much a part and parcel of how, and I don't think it's only the PNM, eh? this is very much a part and parcel of how significant parts of our governing class see things. Eh? This is how they see it. They won the election, they put you as chairman of this, you go and you run it. 
They don't want to get into no long thing. And if they run, if they run into you somewhere and they have to talk with you, they will talk with you. If somebody like me do something in the papers, they may have to say, yeah, but I saw that thing in the papers. But they're not really taking you on. They, they run in the country. Running in the country is a lot of work and they don't have time for you. So that's, that's the story there.